Hello beautiful people, my name is Amanda Zetto. If you are new here, I make motorcycle travel vlogs, how-tos, and general encouragement for you to get out and do the thing. Today, I'm going to be addressing your concerns about motorcycle camping. Over on Instagram a little while ago, I asked you, you know, if you want to go motorcycle camping, but you haven't yet, what has been keeping you from doing the thing? So I've got some of your questions and I'm gonna answer them today. If you're wondering what the heck's happening, I am in Utah, and don't worry, the series is coming soon, but I wanted to put this together and put this out for you right now while I'm on the road. This is coming to you from the road, so if this isn't as fancy as my normal videos, please give me a little bit of leeway, because this was edited on a tablet. <laughs> there is a storm coming. It's massive. <laughs> we'll see if I can get this done before it, it comes. Concern. I'll never want to go back home and just wander away and be a nomad. I mean, I can't really help you with this if uh, if you get out and do the thing and find that you never want to go back home. Uh, I don't have an answer for that, mainly because I always want to go back home. A, my partner is there and I love him dearly. Uh, B, uh, my bed is awesome. Don't get me wrong, my x pad and my new sleeping bag are incredible and very comfy and I always look forward to going to bed every night, but they are no match for the wonderful mattress that I have at home. There's just no competing with it, so yeah. <laughs> All right, next. How do you choose a location for camping? Is this like technical, like about like the ground that you found or like just finding campgrounds in general? Uh, first, I have been using Onyx Off-Road to find my campsites for the last two years and that has been awesome. There are, of course, lots of other ways to find campgrounds and that kind of stuff. I do have a whole video about how to find free camping. Onyx Off-Road is just easiest for me because I'm already using it as a mapping app and it has a lot of icons for forces of campgrounds and dispersed campgrounds and state park campgrounds and on and on and on and on. <laughs> as far as finding a spot to camp and whether or not you should camp there, you want, of course, as level ground as possible. You don't want to be in a dip because if it does rain, water will find its way to the lowest point. Small common sense things like that. If you can, try not to camp underneath of a dead tree. I think that Tim, uh, FDA Adventures, has a video about finding the perfect spot to go camping, I think. Also, I'm gonna add on here, if you do choose to go to Spurs Camping, there I have a whole video all about the do's and don'ts of Spurs Camping that I did with my friend Maggie. And I will link that down in the description because that's very important information. If you do go to Spurs Camping, quite literally leave no trace. That place should look exactly like it was when you got there, unless there was trash. Please pack out the trash, even if you did not leave it. Cool? Cool. <laughs> I'm concerned about the total cost and investment of gear. I do have a whole video about finding camping gear on a budget. I will also link that down in the description. And not just like go to a Walmart or go to a Target or go to a military surplus store because that's not always the answer. But the main thing is to either buy your gear used, which is an excellent option. A lot of my gear is actually used. The x -Ped sleeping pad that I have is actually used. Um, there's lots of resources. Definitely go watch that video if you are concerned about the cost of the equipment. Buy one piece at a time slowly over time. You do not have to go out and buy all of the stuff all at once, you know? That's gonna hurt anybody's wallet. It's so windy. <laughs> if I don't get a shower at the end of a ride, I sleep in, it cut it off. But the gist is that you're concerned about hygiene and you want to have a shower every day. There are campgrounds that have showers. <laughs> KOAs have showers, they're a little bit more expensive though, but there are quite a few state park campgrounds that have showers. Um, if showers is something that you need, that is something that you can do. You just need to do a little bit more research ahead of time to make sure that the spots that you're going to camp along the way are going to have working showers that are open. <laughs> I'm trying to use the bike as a bit of a wind block now. <laughs> Do you carry a battery jumper, and if so, which kind? I do! I carry a MicroStart Sport Jump Pack. I have had to use it once, and not even on my bike. Highly recommended. <laughs> Another concern, do you pack a lot of food, or do you restock along the way? I restock along the way. There are a couple of pieces that I always pack before I leave, like I have one or two like ready to eat meals, like whether that's a can of soup, whether that's a dehydrated meal. I have something there just in case I get to camp and I just do not have the energy or the willpower to like make proper food. The short story is that 
you restock along the way. Yes, carry a little bit of food with you always, just for emergencies, if you get stuck someplace. For the most part, there are grocery stores everywhere. Even in small rural towns, the general store will have some kind of grocery options for the locals. I have never been to a place in the United States where I haven't been able to find a grocery store in a day or two's travel, you know? I'm sure that might be a little bit different in Alaska, but <laughs> even if you're doing a BDR, there is gonna be grocery stores. You have to find gas. Where there is gas, there is food. How do you carry or source enough water in hot climates? I uh, carry a lot of water bladders. A lot is exaggerating. I have like, I have two water bladders and a water bottle. So I have a four liter water bladder, which is more than enough for me. And then a two and a half liter water bladder that sits in my hydration backpack. And then I have a 16 ounce water bottle that I use exclusively for electrolytes. <laughs> as long as there's a gas station, you know, they have water there. <laughs> Most gas stations that have a soda fountain have a little water thing on the soda fountain and uh, that's how I fill up my water bladder. And I, of course, always ask before I do so. It's always better to uh, start with kindness. And uh, I've never been told no before, but I, of course, always ask. And then I always ask after the fact whether or not you have to pay for it or not. There are some places that are super high elevation where they have to truck literally everything in. And in some of those places, you do have to pay for water. So always ask. Um, but I haven't had any issue finding water, even in the southern part of the United States. Uh, of course, like I don't spend five days in the desert. Uh, I'm normally moving, but even then, there's town nearby, there's a way to find water. Uh, it's raining on me now, <laughs> so we're gonna move. <laughs> okay, I think I found a safer part of the park that's outside of the rainstorm. People stealing gear off of my bike when I have to make a stop. Uh, that is a genuine concern. There are a couple different options. First, I will tell you my personal experience. I do not try to spend a lot of time in urban areas. And if I do have to go into a grocery store, I try to find grocery stores on the outskirts of town or at a, in a smaller town. And then I take like my camera gear in with me. I have a little backpack strap on my tank bag and most of my camera gear is in my tank bag. And then I'll take my action cameras and put them in a pocket and I'll go in and buy groceries. And uh, that has worked out fine for me. So all that stuff goes with me. And another thing that I've learned over the years is that uh, the easier it is to grab off of the bike, the more likely it is to get stolen. And Joe Schmo down the street probably has no idea how to open my saddlebags because there's like six different connecting straps and that kind of stuff. And uh, if it takes more than a second to grab off of the bike, the less likely it is to get stolen. And the only thing that I have ever had stolen off of the bike was a tripod in Yellowstone National Park. And that tripod was sitting kind of like out, just strapped loosely in a netting strap on the back of my bike. It was very obvious, they could see it, you know, and it was easy to grab, so it was gone. I have had nothing else stolen off the bike, and I have now traveled clear across country and back, um, spent time on the East Coast, all of those things. When I go to a restaurant, I'll try to pick restaurants that have big open windows and a parking lot near those windows. I'll park my bike near a window. I'll ask to be sat near the window so I can keep it on my bike. Most people are very accommodating about that. Um, although the whole time that I've been doing this, I've never seen anybody like actually try to put hands on my bike while I'm eating. They will come up to the bike, they'll look at it, cause I'm, there's a lot of stuff happening on this bike. So, you, you know, it's kind of an oddball. Um, <laughs> they'll look at the bike, but I've never had anybody touch the bike or, you know, try to take anything off of it while I'm eating. I also just don't honestly spend a whole lot of time away from the bike when I'm traveling by myself. Uh, I don't like park at trailheads and go for a hike or anything like that, so I can't speak to that specifically. Um, as for the bike itself, I know that Doodle highly, highly recommends um, a disc lock. I think it's by Kryptonite or something like that. I'm concerned about fitting everything on a smaller cruiser. <laughs> I have a 2020 Rebel and I do not bag light. <laughs> Duffel bags are your friend. <laughs> If you have a back seat on a bike, you can fit a bag on that bike. Um, obviously, I would highly recommend getting saddlebags for it, but I totally understand if this is something new to you, you don't know if you wanna continue to do it, you don't necessarily want to make the investment into racks for those saddlebags and then the cost of the saddlebags themselves. And you can fit everything you need to go camping in a 40 liter duffel. If it does not fit in a 40 liter duffel, 
It does not have to go with you. It is a luxury. If that is not enough, then y yeah, you, you, need, you need to get saddlebags. I'm pretty sure they make saddlebags for the Rebel. Pretty sure. Don't quote me. But I was going motorcycle camping off of my Honda Shadow 750. It's not a huge cruiser. Um, and I found throw over saddlebags, soft saddlebags. Um, I had, I believe I had two duffels on the back of it because the saddlebags were pretty small. Um, and I also do not pack light. I don't know if you, I don't know if you caught on to that or not. But <laughs> There's actually quite a few of you who are concerned about how to tie stuff onto the bike properly and you're afraid of losing it. Um, so let me know down in the comments if you would like me to make a whole video about uh, strapping luggage to the bike. Um, I could probably get somebody else to let me borrow their bike and uh, do like a demonstration of how I do it on my bike and how I would do it on a cruiser, maybe a sport bike. Let me know if that would be useful. <laughs> oh, send it stuff is concerned about overpacking. But if you are genuinely concerned about overpacking, I would lay everything out that you think that you need to take, try to pack it, but also try to pack like a gallon Ziploc bag of socks or something like that. And if it doesn't all fit in the saddle bag or whatever bag with that bag of socks, then you need to pare it down a bit until that works. Um, because of course, like as you go down the road, nothing goes back into the bags the way that it did when you were at home, like in a nice controlled environment, packing everything away perfectly you know folded and everything else of course you don't take the extra bag of socks with you but that accounts for how, how everything will grow once you get down the road and of course like over time you'll get a much better idea of what you need and what you don't need okay last one for today a lot of you are concerned about nightlife um or creepy wood noises or bears or just generally safety uh, traveling as a solo person on a motorcycle this is a huge topic. It's not something that I'm going to be able to answer fully in a short format like this. The simple things that I will add here is like, again, listen to your gut. If you do not feel good in a place, just go, you know, don't stay in that place. I always uh, have make sure that most people know where I am. Um, they know the route that I was planning to take. Uh, I update them by a text of when I stop at gas stops. And they also can follow me either with a GPS tracker or through Google Maps. You can share your location live with other people. If, I, if I'm not in service, then I have a GPS satellite messenger. Um, right now I'm trying out the somewhere device. Um, in the past I have used the Carmen in reach and they are both very awesome for being able to text and keep in contact with people even when you are out of service. As for dealing with night life, like wildlife, um, make sure that you always clean up all your food after you're done with it. Um, I have a rule where uh, I will, you know, make dinner for the night and then I pack everything up and clean it that night and pack it away so that it's ready to go the next day. If I am in a bear active area, that's a whole different story. You want to either hang your food properly, have a bear canister, or store it uh, in a bear safe container. A lot of campgrounds and bear active areas will have food like bear safe containers to put your food. And uh, if I am gonna have to camp in a bear active area, I tend to float towards those kinds of campgrounds so I don't have to worry about carrying a bear canister. Um, there are of course like Kevlar uh, ursacs and I do own one. However, the downside of those things is that if a bear does get their hands on it, your food is gonna be destroyed anyway. It will protect the bear because the bear won't get your food, but uh, you won't be able to eat that food afterwards. <laughs> if you're camped out in the middle of the woods and you hear some noises and you're all freaked out about it, just stick your head out and look because if you don't, you're just gonna sit there and worry about it all night. Also, earplugs are a thing. But it's always good to be aware of your surroundings, know where your exits are. Um, if I pull into a campground or a campsite or a dispersed campsite, I will always turn my bike around so that in a pinch, if I needed to abandon everything and go, all I had to do was get on the bike and go. I didn't have to worry about turning the bike around or anything like that. Always knowing where your key is, always putting it in the same place so that if you had to leave in an instant, you there's no hesitation. You know exactly where your key is and you can get and you can go. This is also something that you'll learn over time, understanding the difference between like malicious animal noises versus like docile animal noises that are just kind of a part of the nightlife that they're not there to like get you you know oh it's starting to rain on me again oh no 
All right, beautiful people, that's gonna be it for today. I hope that you enjoyed today's video. Make sure that you hit that like and subscribe button if you did. Huge, huge shout out to my patrons on Patreon who make these videos possible. If for as little as $1 a month, you can support the channel and get early access to these videos ad-free before the rest of the world. If you can't do that right now, that is absolutely okay. I appreciate you guys just for being here every single week. <sighs> Truck's coming. I don't have a question for the end screen crew this week, but uh, if you made it to the end of the video, put down in the comments. Rain clouds move fast. <laughs> so that I know that you made it to the end. Okay, you guys. I'll see you later.